All right, I guess my clock is going here, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Dreamforce. Hope everyone's having a great day so far. Uh, my name is Scott Klassen. I'm an architect at Heroku, and this is Beyond the Monolith, Principles for Architecting Microservice Applications on Heroku. So before we jump into the microservices, let's give you the wall of text that you've probably seen several times today. This is the safe harbor statement. It's simply, simply, if I can summarize, it says, base your purchasing decisions on features that are generally available. We're gonna talk about a lot of generally available features here, but we're also gonna talk about some public and perhaps private beta features. So base your purchasing decisions on those features that are GA. So here's the agenda. So we're gonna talk, why are we here? Why microservices? What good are they? And then we'll, uh, we'll do some background on Heroku. We'll talk about Heroku private spaces um, with a focus on the DNS or the Dino DNS registry, which uh, enables a lot, uh, a lot more uh, architectural options for microservices and for other types of applications on Heroku. And then we'll cover some just general principles uh, that I think are important for architecting microservices applications on Heroku as well. And then we'll go through a case study which is Heroku's own journey uh, from monolith to microservices to what I, what I like to call a microservices solar system, where there's still the remnants of a big monolith in the center, like the sun, and there's microservices floating around and coming and going. So why microservices, right? So the promises are you know, productivity, agility, adaptability, scalability. Um, productivity, uh, you can kind of you can kind of think about what what happens when you have a monolith. Monolith, we talk about one big code base, one service, one kind of deployment. Uh, that's simple. That's great when you have one team working on it, deploying. Two teams working on the same code base deployments. Okay, that might work. Three. Okay, four, five, six. As you grow, hopefully your business is successful and you grow. At some point, there's a lot of contention on that monolith and getting things done gets harder and harder. So that's where the microservices style of appli uh, application has arisen. So it also you know, allows for more agility where if you have a lot of different services, you can, instead of having this one big deployment that you have to ship code in, you can spin up services if you have a, you know, an application and ops that can support it. And if you're on Heroku, that's very easy, by the way. Um, you can just spin up another service that consumes some other services. You can adapt by you know, building a third service that consumes two other backing services in novel ways, and there you go. You can spin them up, you can spin them down. If they're not successful, they can go away. If they're successful, they can stick around. And then if you need to scale these services, it's perhaps easier to scale you know, if you have one endpoint in your monolith that takes 99% of your traffic. Uh, it's perhaps easier to scale that if it's an independent service. And we'll look at that. So let's look a little bit more about the promise of microservices. Right? So this is really the promise from an organizational perspective, right? Higher long-term engineering productivity. Who doesn't want that, right? As you can see, you know, as, as I talked about before, in the beginning when there's you know, few teams, few services, uh, there's sort of some inherent complexity in running microservices that sort of doesn't pay off in comparison to the benefits. But again, as your complexity grows here, and you could also maybe substitute time on that axis because as, as we progress along time, things get more complex. And at some point, there's a trade-off where the monolithic architecture makes you more longer-term product, productive. So the great thing about that is that Heroku is great for running monoliths too, and great for running microservices architectures, and we provide an easy path from one to the other if you happen to be making that transition. So uh, before I go too much further, can I just do a show of hands? So who here is familiar with Heroku? Kind of knows, knows what it does, kind of deployed an app on Heroku before? Uh, okay, great. Um, how about private spaces? Heard of them? Know what they are? Anyone deployed a private space app? Cool, heard about the DNS feature, probably, cool. Uh, and then how about uh, Salesforce developers? And how about folks that are doing greenfield mono, uh, microservices applications, got microservices already? And how about people with the more old school monolith type situation that you're perhaps 
happy or sad with. Cool. So uh, I'll, uh, let's talk about why not microservices and then we'll do some Heroku background. So why not microservices? Monolith is not without its charms, right? We do this for a reason. Right, it's a single code base. You can use things like database transactions to make a consistent view of the world. You can shield yourself from sort of the complexities of the real world of more than one system. Makes things a lot easier to deal with. Um, so if you don't, you know, it, microservices, you know, operating more than one thing and deploying more than one thing, you know, you need some infrastructure to support that. And of course, as I said before, Heroku is there to help you with a lot of that. So let's go through just some background on Heroku. What is Heroku? It's a cloud platform. Instead of having to deal with all this stuff, you kind of just deal with deploy, manage, and scale. It's focused on apps instead of in infrastructure, right? So you don't deal with servers, you deal with just your apps and you let your developers focus on the value add that they bring instead of undifferentiated heavy lifting. So you write code in whatever language, deploy it, with the famous git push Heroku master or using CI or uh, other uh, GitHub deployment mechanisms that we have. Uh, again, we run your workload in dynos. So what are dynos? Uh, a lot of people, like I'm sure have heard of Docker at this point. Um, we use the same underlying technology that Docker uses, C groups, namespaces. Uh, we've been doing containerization for you know, five, six, seven years now, even before Docker was around, it's, it's the same thing. So uh, if it, if at, at runtime, it's, you know, very similar. Tons of add-ons, our own Heroku data services make it easy to build microservices applications that should uh, have their own database. And then users access the app or the web. And when you need to scale, you just scale up, scale your database, Scale your teams, scale your metrics. So here, that's, that's the only proprietary file you need in your app. Tell Heroku, what's your web process, what's your worker process, what's your console process, any other processes that you'd like us to run. So, simple. And then Heroku create my app, git push Heroku master and Heroku scale my app to four web processes and two worker processes. There you go, you've deployed a Heroku app. Super straightforward. So uh, touch real briefly on Heroku Connect here. Uh, hopefully those Salesforce devs have heard of it. Hopefully you're using it, it's awesome. Point and click bi-directional sync between your Salesforce org and your Heroku Postgres database. Uh, you know, graphically configured, uh, super awesome for doing joint Salesforce and Heroku apps. Again, you can build apps that span Heroku and Salesforce uh, using Salesforce APIs and data in Heroku Postgres from your org. You can go the other way and sync data using external objects and sort of build force apps with the data in Heroku databases as well. So let's talk about private spaces. So this is the project that I work on and uh, I think is awesome. Uh, so what are they? They're kind of your own dedicated Heroku. They're, they're, you get your own uh, sort of private space, if you will. Um, uh, it has some additional features over the, the standard Heroku runtime in that dynos can exchange traffic between each other, which you can't do on the common runtime, which opens up a lot of microservices use cases. And then you can uh, have some additional network controls. You can whitelist traffic that's coming into the space. You can whitelist traffic that's going out of the space. And you can also have, you also have a set of static IPs. So if you want to say, whitelist your space into a Salesforce org or any other resource that gets protected by IP ranges, you can do that and have secure communications in that manner. Again, very similar to Heroku. Uh, you basically won't notice much. Um, the, the developer experience is preserved between private spaces and sort of traditional Heroku, if you will. Um, we have a network, again, the network boundary is there, private runtime, all operated by Heroku for you, so you don't have to deal with all this stuff. So let's talk about a little deep dive into the network layout in a private space, um, and we'll, talk, we'll get to the microservices here when we get to the private network. So the DMZ network is kind of a standard network where your web traffic ingresses to your private VPC. Uh, kind of st a standard thing. The NAT network is for, your, again, your outgoing traffic. Traffic going out to the internet goes through a NAT gateway, which has some static IPs on, which allow you to do the whitelisting that I mentioned before. 
And then where all the fun stuff happens is in the private network. So this allows dyno to dyno communication between your processes in the space, and it allows a new class of add-on, which are our, our private database add-ons, which allow you to talk to that private database over a private connection rather than going out over the internet. So how do I create a space? Super simple, Heroku-like experience. Heroku Spaces create my space in my org. I wait for the space to be provisioned. It takes a few minutes to spin up the VPC and all the infrastructure in it. And then from that point, it's Heroku create my app in the space. And then from then on, you don't have to know Really, that's an app in a space if you don't want to. There are additional features, of course, that you can take advantage of. So let's talk about one of them. Actually, let me mention before that I get into this, there is another talk uh, on private spaces at Thursday 8.30 if you're, if you're interested in hearing more about the network controls and the things you can do with a private space other than microservices. So Dino DNS registry for private spaces. Alert, alert, public beta feature, not GA. So. Uh, it will be soon, though, if I have anything to do with it. So again, unlike the common runtime um, where you can't talk between your dynos, um, you can enter private space. And so this, again, opens up a whole lot of architectural options that you don't have on traditional Heroku. And it's a super simple DNS-based thing with some additional environment variables injected into each dyno to uh, make using the DNS features easy. And we'll take a look at how this works. So each app, each dyno in the space gets a domain name that uh, you, you know, is propagated. The IP address, when, it, when a dyno restarts, its IP address changes, the DNS is updated in low latency across the space. We start, every, every private domain has app.local space, so those are the in-space lookups. We get a third level of the app name, which is cool app here. We get a fourth level of cool service, and fifth level of the dyno number. So if you're running one cool service process in the cool app, that's its DNS name. When it gets restarted and the IP address changes, low latency propagation of that DNS lookup, you look it up, you get the right place. So let's look at the environment variables involved and sort of how they map and how you might make use of them. So first, we to every dyno, we give it a Heroku DNS app name. That just kind of makes it easy to you know, figure out and do substringing and compose other DNS names that you might want to access from your app. It's not actually resolvable. The Roku DNS formation name is also injected into every dyno, and so all the cool service, .cool, all the cool service dynos in cool app would get that as the Roku DNS formation name. It also resolves, so it's a round robin DNS name. So if you have one cool service dyno, it'll have the one IP address in there. If you have 10 or 50, It'll be a round robin DNS record of all those. So you can do round robin load balancing, or you know you can do a use that record to do client side load balancing with Nginx or any of the open source solutions that might do that these days. And there's another level which is the Heroku DNS Dyno name, which is the I, the host name of the Dyno you're running. So if you're a Dyno and you want to publish a domain name that someone can get you at in the space, that's the name you publish. And then you get the private IP. So if you want to know what IP address you need to bind to to communicate in space, there you go. So that's how it works. So what does that let you do? Well, it enables a whole new class of microservices applications on Heroku. That's what it does. So the first one, we talked about the formation level round robin DNS. So we got a front end server here. It might be your web UI. It might be an API front end that makes calls to back end servers. Um, this, is, this would be a typical stateless microservice here that's just scaled up and down as needed. So uh, you know, as we can see here, you know, one, two, there might be 10, there might be one. The front end server uses the formation level DNS name to access that server through just plain utilizing the round robin DNS or again, client side load balancing to access that service. Easy. So another sort of more stateful way you might use this is the dyno DNS, dyno DNS names directly, right? So let's say we have a sharded service. We have a lot of data, or we want to keep all the data in memory in the backend servers, and we want to shard that out. 
uh, and let's say we're using Heroku Kafka and we have a topic with two partitions. So let's make each backend server consume a specific partition. So in Kafka, you typically partition the data by some key, some ID, right? So you'll know, the front end server will know if it needs to do some sort of lookup by ID, the, the key space of ID one goes to Dino one and the key space of ID two goes to Dino two. And it will use the Dino DNS names to call the correct backend service and get the data. So you could have, you know, all the data that fits in memory and you, you work that out to how you're doing your keys for Kafka and it's, it's a pretty easy way to scale out and have a sort of more in memory and more stateful type of microservice architecture on Heroku. So what else can you do? This isn't necessarily microservices, but if anyone here uh, saw the talk a little while ago about machine learning on Heroku, uh, they, were, they were kind of focused on a single node common runtime Heroku. Well, this is what you can do in a private space, right? So all the primitives are there. The, 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 essentially what Spark needs for, for each process is a Spark public IP and a Spark domain name, essentially. There's some environment variables that ex the names of which escape me at this moment, but you just map that on very simply and then you can do all this communication. So here we have the Spark workers connecting to the Spark master using the Spark master's dyno name. There's, there's a proxy server here that can talk to any of the Spark processes in the space. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with Spark, Spark, the Spark master throws up its own web UI, each Spark worker throws up a web UI, each Spark driver or Spark job throws up its own web UI. So um, how do you get at those? Well, DNS. And then again, the, the driver would talk to the worker, sorry, the driver would talk to the master to ask, ask it to do some work. The master farms that work out to the workers, the workers do work and return the results directly to the driver. And that would all use the DNS feature. So how do I use this? Again, it's a beta feature. I uh, hope to ship it as soon as possible. It works great, but I use it a lot. Uh, spaces DNS registry, labs enable, and restart the app, and there you go. So to note, if you're gonna try this out, you want to enable this feature on the app that is performing the lookups, not the app that is the target of the lookups. So let's talk about some principles for architecting microservice applications on Heroku. So we provide a lot of primitives for you. We provide a lot of operations for you. That doesn't mean you magically get a scalable microservices organization. There's some things that you have to do yourself, unfortunately. We do as much as we can, I think. So let's talk about three key principles. There's lots of great writing out there. Um, I, I don't, I'm not gonna uh, you know, go on and on about this, but three that I think are important are bounded contexts, designing for failure, and instrumenting for observability. Uh, there's more reading. My, Martin Fowler is a prolific writer on microservices and other technology, and Chris Richardson has some good stuff too on the Nginx blog if you're more interested. So let's talk about data on the inside versus data on the outside or bounded contexts. So when you go to a microservices architecture, you, you, what you don't wanna do is build two, three, four services that all talk to the same database because you're not gonna gain the coordination free behavior that you might otherwise gain if you do that. If you do that, you're kind of built a distributed monolith, which is really the worst of both worlds because you're distributed and you're still a monolith. So you don't want to do that. So the service needs to own its own data, its own database, its own data store. It doesn't have to be a relational database. It can be whatever data store matches whatever the service is doing. Uh, and then services, of course, expose a service interface of some sort, an API, if you will. Um, there's a whole continuum that you'll have to make a decision about like how rigid or flexible are you gonna be on API versioning and compatibility. You can go so far as to have a, a, a versionable schema for every service you publish and have some strong guarantees about you know, backwards compatibility. That's more of an organizational thing. How far you plan on going on that and how disciplined your organization can be there is gonna, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna, the more disciplined you can be, the less problems you have. The less disciplined you can, maybe you can get by with that. Uh, and, you know, have a few problems. 
up to you to decide. So again, you're unlikely to get the granularity right. So you're not gonna go, boom, Greenfield, perfect microservice architecture, right? You're gonna refactor, things are gonna be wrong. Some services are gonna be large. You might have a solar system where there's one central service and like little services floating around. That's okay, like it doesn't have to be perfect. This, this is sort of life, evolution, it's, it's, it's okay. Heroku, Postgres, and Redis make it really easy to have services that own their own data stores. Um, so that's, that's a huge thing to have in a microservices architecture. It makes it really easy to do the right thing. So designing for failure. Another thing you don't want to do when you're building a microservice architecture is have any sort of dependency of service A being up before you can deploy service B or you know, specific versions being up or the world blows up. Again, if you do that, you've kind of, again, built a distributed monolith, which is not what we want to do. So you want to you know, gracefully handle failures in backend services, right? You want to provide a partial result instead of a ugly error page, right? So if service B is down because it's being deployed for 10 seconds, your front end app should not you know, indicate that the world is on fire and blow up. It should gracefully fail and, you know, using uh, circuit breakers and other techniques to, you know, gracefully recover when that backend service happens uh, to come back, which it will, hopefully, uh, you will be good to go. So circuit breakers um, are kind of a way of not causing cascading failures. They're becoming more and more common. Netflix has a library called Hystrix, which is for the JVM. Yammer has a clone of that for Node. Um, most languages have something to do so that you don't, uh, you know, to, to make retries and back offs and the kind of things you want to do to not just explode right away uh, a lot easier for you. Heroku will handle a bunch of failure cases for you. So the, you're not gonna have to like reboot the server, fix the hardware, fix the network. It'll get restored. The DNS records will be updated where the new stuff is and when it comes back, you're good to go if you've designed for failure. So instrumenting for observability. So it's kind of easy to know what's going on in a monolith, right, which is one of the, one of the nice things about it, but you need to have actionable logs, metrics, and alerting in a microservice architecture. So what does that mean? That means, well, it means thinking about your log messages, right? You don't just write whatever in log messages. You want to design them to be searchable. You want to have things like request IDs in there that span through the service call chain. So if you have a front-end app that calls service A, that calls service B, that calls service D, you want to thread a request ID or some other identifier through there so when you can do a log search, you can figure out like where that call went. Use these providers or other providers. So Heroku has some great metrics out of the box for you. Uh, we give you the sort of generic metrics in our dashboard. You can instrument your app to ex uh, export metrics to Librato. They do some great graphing. New Relic has a similar thing. Paper Trail is a log provider. Roll Bar is an exception tracking mechanism. So these, these are all things you're gonna wanna have when you go microservices. So. Let's talk about Heroku's own journey from a monolithic architecture to microservices. So let's see. This is kind of what Heroku looked like uh, when you talk about the core of how Heroku works. There was a, a big core application that had sort of almost everything, all of the user-facing behavior that talked to a, a routing and a runtime and a logging sort of backend services, and that kind of, at a very high level, constitutes what Heroku is. There's some other front-end services there, but this is generally, you know, what it looked like at that time. Uh, and again, so we had, like I said, there's only a few front-end services at this point, and there's not that many engineers, right? There's 15 engineers probably for all this, so there's probably five engineers working on the core at all times. So that's fine, that, that a monolith worked at that point. So a couple of years later, starting to grow. Um, got about 45 engineers now and we kind of reached the point where we're like, hmm, let's not put this new thing in the core. Let's try 
a service. Let's break it out. In the core, again, was also was the UI, was the API, was the was the workers, all sorts of stuff. So we broke out the the UI, the front end, into the dashboard, put a new org service and a new event service. So that was that was kind of cool. We were kind of you know getting service oriented here. Uh, you'll notice one thing here, this bi-directional arrow is kind of an anti-pattern. Um, we'll see how that got resolved later. So 2013, we released our platform API and in doing so we kind of introduced some complexity, as you can see. So what did we do? Well, we, we factored out all the sort of API endpoints into its own app kind of kept the core app that's doing all the orchestration down here, and we still had the orgs and events. Getting a lot more engineers at this point, and the one thing that is better, not that the old core did not have an API, but it was kind of an organic API, if you will, something that's evolved over time, and you know it wasn't the easiest thing to use. So we made our V3, what we call the platform API, uh, we had some tooling around, you know, both generating documentation and schema validation for the API and the ability for people to actually generate clients if you needed to. So front-end services start to tick up at this point. So hey, aren't we back to where we were? Well, we are at a diagram level, but what splitting out the API from the core gave us a chance to do was we decided, okay, we want to actually get rid and go back to one core sun in this solar system. Well, when we put all of the stuff from core back into the API, we got to do it in a well-considered way. Instead of an organically grown way, we got to refactor, and this is a much nicer place to be. We also got more engineers. We also got more front-end services, maybe because we had an API that was more documented and more easily consumed, I think. At this point, we also released a, a toolkit called Pliny, which is a, a sort of a bootstrapping mechanism for bootstrapping Ruby services. So if you want to build a, a microservice in Ruby, you use this Pliny toolkit. If anyone's interested later, I can show you where that lives on GitHub. And uh, yeah, so the number of services start to grow, the number of engineers start to grow. And now we get to more modern day. So we've introduced an API gateway, right? So all the traffic that comes into sort of inside the Heroku core travels through an API gateway. Much of it is dispatched then to the Heroku API. But now we're starting to get other services behind that API where normally there would have been some, some proxy in here that's calling to a service and proxying back through and on. Instead, we have a nice gateway where we can add facing services like the event service. If anyone saw the talk earlier about uh, Heroku Kafka dog fooding, uh, where we introduced the event bus, this is the event bus. And you notice we got rid of that ugly bi-directional line there. So we kind of uh, got to uh, a cleaner architecture. Now look, where did this go? This went in. We made a mistake. The bounded context was not correct for orgs. So what do we do? We refactored, we corrected it. We didn't get it right out of the box. You're not gonna get everything right out of the box. It's okay. And we got to today where we're much happier. We have less than 100, but way more than before front end services. We have about 200 engineers and we're continuing to grow and grow more engineers, more services, uh, and all sorts of good stuff like that. And that's the talk. I have plenty of time for questions, it looks like, and uh, thank you. Questions? Yeah, grab uh, the mic so if you have, have any question, questions. Could you just put your hand up? I'll also be at the Heroku booth from five to eight tonight if you have any other questions that occur to you later. Over here. Yeah. Uh, hi. Sorry. Oh, hi, hey. A uh, quick question. Uh, with this new private spaces, do you support mutual SSL? Uh, we don't, uh, but it is a asked for thing. Um, there is dedicated routing infrastructure in the private space, so it is something that is certainly possible to do, and whenever it comes up on the roadmap, 
I cool. assume that it will get done. I can't, again, prom say yeah, that's something I can't we're promise, struggling but with now. yes, yes, we, yeah. we, we hear you, we hear you. No worries, thanks. <laughs> uh, are there performance improvements like when using private services, other than like the, you mentioned privacy and the DNS. Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, not that you, you can still do microservices on traditional Heroku, but what's gonna happen, you're gonna go through a lot more hops, right? So you're gonna go back out through the, the public ELB back through the routing fleet back to the other app that you're trying to connect to. So that's fine for a lot of use cases. Like, not every app is super latency sensitive. That's totally fine. Microservices on common runtime Heroku are great too. But yes, you can do low latency services. You can do TCP-based services, right? You don't, you don't have to do HTTP. You can do HTTP2 gRPC bidirectional streaming in private spaces. You can do, you know, you can run a Kafka cluster and do all the remoting that it does in a, in a private space. So um, there is the potential for more performance there. Uh, and again, you have dedicated instances where if you're, if you're using performance uh, dynos in the common runtime, those are also dedicated, but um, there's again, you know, potential for higher performance, yeah. Great. Is there a developer or free tier for the private spaces as well? Uh, there is not. That it, well, yes, there is not. So, you, so private spaces uh, is part of Heroku Enterprise. So you have, if you have a Salesforce salesperson or a contract, uh, you know, you can get them to give you get you Heroku and get private spaces turned on, um, um, and that, that's the sort of mechanism at this point. Can you just give a brief overview of what went into the event bus, the uh, technology platform on Kafka? Uh, I know there was a session earlier, but sure. just really high level, if you could talk through that. Yeah, so, uh, so Kafka itself is a, is a great, highly scalable uh, distributed transaction log, if you will. Like, it's, it's a public, publish subscribe model where you can, um, you know, pick up where you left off or rewind in the stream. So like it's not like consume now or it's gone kind of thing. So for the event bus, right, it, it, it drives a lot of Heroku's internal processes. So uh, whenever anything happens at Heroku, so someone creates an app, someone uh, scales up an app, someone runs a dyno, there's an event on that event bus. And so uh, what can you do with that? Well, you can have your microservices instead of like polling some endpoint all the time. You can have it listening to, a, to the event bus and reacting to that and sending a notification when something happens or uh, you know uh, doing any any other arbitrary thing. Uh, did, was, there, was that was that good? Yeah, yeah. So we. Uh, we started with, uh, so we run on Amazon, right? So we, we started with Kinesis uh, because our service was not baked. Um, Kinesis is fine for many use cases. It's not re really great for an event bus type solution with high fan out um, because uh, there is a five read transaction per second limitation on a Kinesis shard. So. On an event bus like this, this is not like super high throughput IoT data. This is like high value, medium throughput data that can maybe fit on a shard or a few shards, right? But then if you want to have more than five or 10 or 50 or 100 consumers, how do you time slice that into five reads per second? You, you can't. And so you have to do all sorts of hacks to make that work. So in, in my mind, Kafka is far superior to that, uh, of course. We have Heroku Kafka where someone operates it for you. So it's again, uh, if you don't ha if you don't want to use that, um, Kinesis is great because it's managed. But Heroku Kafka is managed too. So and it's actually real Kafka, and so um, I would tend to prefer that. Uh, but I do use Kinesis and other services internally at Heroku as well. So. Uh, if you have to build uh, stateful microservices. Yes for cache reasons or whatever, would you use Redis? Is this a, a standard solution in order to, to, to share data between Dinos? Or what would uh, you recommend? Here? So so if you can use, it, it really depends on the use case. And so like Heroku Postgres is just the go-to. Like if, if it can work in a, in a Postgres database, uh, I would say yes, do that. Um, Redis is, is a more like in-memory 
Um, so it can be faster for a lot of use cases if, it's, if it fits the sort of the key value model of Redis. Redis is great, um, but it is more ephemeral, right? Um, again, we have Heroku Kafka as well, and that, that, can be, that can be a great backend for also some styles of applications, but not all. I think we are done. We're out of time. Oh, one more. Oh, uh, one more. One more. How about one? What, what do you think are the challenges for the uh, next phase of Heroku? Like, where do you see more problems coming? More problems with Heroku. Yeah, or like the microservice architecture. Uh, let's see. So, um, the ne so it'll be interesting to see once people get to use the DNS service discovery. You know, there, there are uh, some tweaks you have to do, like maybe on the JVM you have to uh, tweak your, your TTL so that you'll re-resolve things. Maybe we'll find that like some libraries just never re-resolve and have to be restarted or have some annoying behavior like that. Um, we'll see. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, doing even more with the, with the service discovery stuff. This is just DNS is kind of, you know, ground zero. Every language can do DNS lookups. So. Um, you might say, why don't you use service, DNS service records, which allow you to also expose port information well. That's very uncommonly supported in just base programming languages. But not to say that we can't build libraries for every language we support and do it that way. Yeah, I, I have a, a question about uh, this microservice idea. You say uh, deployment, there should be no impact uh, mm -hmm. of each other. When we started using uh, private spaces, we figured out it's, uh, you know, you don't get cheap dinos any longer because mm -hmm. the simplest one is a, a five units uh, solution. So yep. for sure, uh, pricing is always a kind of negotiation. But uh, what is your hint uh, to make, on the one hand, the microservice strategy, on the other hand, very often you don't have a lot of, you know, heavy workload to manage. Yep. What is your hint for this situation? And I have a second question, but first sure. I stop here. I, I think that uh, you know you you probably know by now that we don't have an awesome story to tell you for like cheap and private and and all that, right? So yes, yeah, so you know we're looking at how we can you know make things cheaper. One sort of semi-hard constraint is the EC2 instances that support um, the networking required to do a private space. You can't use the super small ones. Um, just due to the, the, the way that the, the networks are configured. But we're looking into how we can, we can do that. We're looking into other ways of uh, making it affordable, uh, more affordable as you, you Seriously, we started to refactor our worker strategy. So mm -hmm. we, we implement uh, workers on Node.js. Mm -hmm. So we started to do multi-threaded uh, workers in Node uh, to, in order to use the, the capabilities better. But for this microservice uh, strategy, if I get it right, you more or less you recommend to split up different uh, areas. So uh, at the end, you you easily need for even a, a standard implementation, you need X workers instead of and not because of the horsepower, but because of the granularity you want to uh, to get. And and that that is one question. And the second question is. Um, when you commit to this platform, and the more you use such special things, the more you commit to this Heroku platform, mm -hmm. um, what, what is your best hint to look for, you know, l let us look at Postgres. Postgres, at the moment, the standard is one terabyte, the extension mm -hmm. is two terabyte. Mm -hmm. We are looking for four or eight terabyte. The question is, is there any chance for discussions? Is there a roadmap, or is this, sure. you know, bet to the future? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's definitely, um, you know, I would I would contact your your your, you know, contacts at Heroku, but you can definitely, uh, in certain circumstances, get more than one terabyte. Um, perhaps uh, there's there's other you know data stores that can store the data in different ways. But yeah, I mean, um, be happy to talk to you after after this, and if you if you want um, about how we can help you out. One question, uh, which is the Heroku downtime in production? So is there any published number for the downtime or, or any plan? Or? So I think I think the, our published availability numbers are like 99.99989, somewhere, some, somewhere, somewhere in there. Um, you know, more than four nines um, for what we publish. 
Okay, uh, we gotta clear out, sorry, um, to make room for the next session, I suppose.